My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my functor. Prepare to die. Welcome to a Programming Languages virtual meetup pre-recording. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in today's video, we're going to be covering Chapter 4 of Category Theory for Programmers by Bartosz Maluski. Taking a look at the table of contents, the chapter is entitled Kleisley Categories, and it has three subsections followed by a fourth challenge section, as all chapters are. The three subsections are entitled The Writer Category, Writer in Haskell, and Kleisley Categories. And what we're going to do here is we're going to briefly look at the C++ code that Bartage uses to introduce the writer category and motivate why we might want something like this. Then we're going to look at all of the code in Haskell used to implement this. It fits on a single screen. And then we're going to fully read through the third subsection, Kleisley categories, because I think it sort of ties everything together. And then we're going to spend some time working through the three challenges at the end of this chapter. So. Hopping into the C++ code that Bartage uses to motivate the writer category, he starts off by showing a simple function negate that takes a Boolean, returns a Boolean, and simply just does the negation of the input Boolean. And he comments that in a lot of applications, we might want to add logging facilities uh, to our functions to know when functions are called. And he presents a very suboptimal solution in the form of just having a global logger and then doing a plus equals with a string to the logger, the global logger string, whenever we call one of these functions. And he remarks that this is suboptimal for a number of reasons, but one of the primary reasons is that it is not a pure function. It is a function with side effects. And so he goes on to show a modified version that instead of doing a plus equals to a global string logger, we are now passing in a string logger and doing uh, and basically returning a pair. So we're returning the negative value and then a string, which, it, which is the logger plus the uh, string that we are hard coding in each of our functions. So he says this is better because this is not no longer has side effects and it is pure. However, because we're passing in the logger string, um, it's going to be extremely difficult to sort of keep track and unit test this stuff. We'd have to set up, you know, every single possible combination of like prefix sums of strings in order to get all the combinations. So this is less ideal. So really we want something that looks like the following where we are returning similar to the solution before a Boolean and a string where the first element of our pair is the negated Boolean. Uh, but here we're just returning a hard coded not so and we're not doing anything uh, with a string logger, whether that be global or passed in. And we're going to deal with that later. And I'm not going to show the implementations of two upper and two words, but basically he says, once you have this writer category, it enables you to write code uh, that sort of looks like the following. So here we're trying to get a vector of um, uppercase words. And so first we're taking a string and converting it to uppercase. Then we're taking the results of that and uh, converting it into words. And each time we get P1 and P2, we have the Boolean string pair, where the string is sort of the logged uh, state of what we just did. And the uh, first element of our pair the, uh, is going to be what we're actually caring about. And so in order to write this sort of process, which is the comp composition of these two, two upper and two words, we just call make pair uh, with P2.first, because that's our actual results, and then the concatenation of P1.second and P2.second. So this is pretty pretty nifty, and if you're familiar with uh, monads, this is going to be looking very similar to you. Um, but this is the basic idea. So that's the C++ I'm going to show. I didn't walk through all of the code that's presented in the book because I think this is enough to get the general idea. The two upper and two words implementations are just very messy in C++. And I think at this point, it's useful to hop into the Haskell solution. And note that Bartage in the 3.2 lecture on Kleisley categories fully goes through all of this stuff in more detail. So I highly recommend checking out that video. So here we are at our Haskell implementation of our writer type and our Kleisley operator. And it's sometimes known as the fish operator. So at the top, we're just defining writer to be a type that is a pair of a generic type A. So A can just be anything. And uh, the second element in our pair is a string. And then we define our Kleisley operator. It's going to have a type that takes uh, two functions, an A to a writer B, and then a B to a writer C and uh, you end up with an A uh, to a writer C. So this is basically a composition operator for objects or for functions that are returning these sort of embellished functions is what they call them in the textbook. So in this case, our embellishment is that 
we're returning not just the result, but also uh, a string, which is going to be sort of a logger in the case that's presented in the textbook. And then here we have our implementation that's basically saying apply m1 to our input x, which is going to give you a pair of a string s1 and the result y. Then you take the result y and um, use that as input to m2, which is going to give us another pair of a result z and a second string s2. And then we want to basically return um, the final result z and then the concatenation of s1 and s2, which is super nice um, given how sort of terse and concise Haskell notation is. And uh, there's this convenience helper function return that basically is just going to um, give you the starting point for our writers with an empty string. And then we have upcase and two words, which is basically just um, mapping to upper and using the prelude version um, of a function called words and uh, adding upcase space and two words space as the two logger strings. And then once we've done all this, we can define our process function that we saw earlier, which was like five lines in C++ as just basically a two line type signature, which is actually optional. And uh, then process is equal to the Kleisley composition of upcase and two words. So this is really, really beautiful in my opinion, and sort of starts to show the power of Haskell when compared to a language like C++, in terms of expressiveness at least. And with that, we're going to hop over to 4.3, the third subsection that talks about Kleisley categories. So the text reads, you might have guessed that I haven't invented this category on the spot. It's an example of the so-called Kleisley category, a category based on a monad. We are not ready to discuss monads yet, but I wanted to give you a taste of what they can do. For our limited purposes, a Kleisley category has, as objects, the types of the underlying programming language. Morphisms from type A to type B are functions that go from A to a type derived from B using the particular embellishment. Each Kleisley category defines its own way of composing such morphisms as well as the identity morphisms with respect to the, that composition. Later we'll see that the impre imprecise term embellishment corresponds to the notion of an endofunctor in a category. So if you've ever heard a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors, well, we're starting to pick up the information that we need to understand that statement. And last but not least, the particular monad that I used as the basis of the category in this post is called the writer monad, and it's used for logging or tracing the execution of functions. It's also an example of a more general mechanism for embedding effects in pure computations. You've seen previously that we could model programming language types and functions in the category theory category of sets, disregarding bottoms as usual. Here, we have extended this model to a slightly different category, a category where morphisms are represented by embellished functions and their composition does more than just pass the output of one function to the input of another. We have one more degree of freedom to play with, the composition itself. It turns out that this is exactly the degree of freedom which makes it possible to give simple denotational semantics to programs that in imperative languages are traditionally implemented using side effects. So I thought this chapter was awesome. Uh, working through the exercises is what actually really cemented things for me. So let's hop into the three challenges of this chapter. So the prelude to the exercises states, a function that is not defined for all possible values of its arguments is called a partial function. It's not really a function in the mathematical sense, so it doesn't fit the standard categorical mold. It can, however, be represented by a function that returns an embellished type optional, which is defined as the following. So we have a optional class that is templatized with a type A, and we've got two members, a Boolean is valid and a value uh, that is of the type A, and then we've got uh, some constructors, no big deal, and then an is valid and value methods that return basically is valid and value. And it says, for example, here's the implementation of the embellished function safe root. So if we wanna take the safe root, square root of a double X, we're basically just going to check is x greater than or equal to zero and then we're going to compute the square root of x wrap that in an optional of type double and return that otherwise we're just going to return the default constructor which uh, passes no value and um, is valid is going to be set to false in this case so it is important to note that this blog series which was later turned into a book was originally written in 2014 and at the time, there was no optional type in C++, um, but there is now. It's in a, a header called optional, and basically what you're seeing on the screen here is a simplified version of what we now have in C++ 17. So this was, I'm not sure where it first showed up and what programming language, but um, Haskell's ha has had this since the 90s, 
as a type called maybe and other languages like Rust and Swift have it. Um, they call it option. And it's, it's known as different things in different languages, but this sort of optional type, um, which is used to represent a value that may or may not be there, um, exists in C++17 now, which is fantastic. And these are the three most important, in my opinion, member functions. So has value, value, and value or. So has value just returns you true or false. If the value is there, you can retrieve it with value. And if the value is potentially there and you've got a good default, you can use value or and then specify the default if it doesn't happen to be there. So a very useful facility that exists now in C++17. So moving on to the three exercises that are attached to this sort of prelude, it reads, here's the challenge. Number one, construct the Cleisley category for partial functions, define composition and identity. Number two, implement the embellished function safe reciprocal that returns a valid reciprocal of its argument if it's different from zero. And finally, compose the functions safe root and safe reciprocal to implement safe root reciprocal that calculates square root one over x whenever possible. So first we're gonna do this in C++ and then we're gonna look at uh, a partial solution in APL. So first C++, number one, implement the composition and identity functions for the Cleisley category. I didn't do it for uh, identity because that exists now in our C++20 header, but for compose it looks as follows. It's going to take two functions, f and g, which are both going to be returning optionals. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute f of x, which is going to be stored in res, which is stored for result. And then finally, we're just going to check, does the result have a value? So did we get a value from f, f of x? And if so, then we're going to pass that value by uh, using the value method to the function g, which is then going to either return us uh, a value or a null opt. Um, so null opt is uh, basically the C++ um, library keyword for when a value is not possible um, to be computed. So if we don't have a value from res, then we just have to return std null opt. So that takes care of question one. Question two asks us to define safe reciprocal. So in the book, they give a safe root. Note that I've modified it a tiny bit because in C++17, we have both std optional and we also have another language facility called CTAD, which stands for Class Template Argument Deduction. So in the book, it shows you that you have to explicitly define in angle brackets that your std optional is of type double here. Um, but in C++17, you can actually omit that because it's able to uh, deduce that from a couple different places. One, we have square root n, which is gonna return a double, but also two in the type signature, we've said that we're returning a std optional double. So it's uh, redundant here, so we don't need, we can omit it. And for question two, we're basically, uh, it looks very similar to safe root. Instead of doing square root, we're doing one divided by n, and instead of checking that we're greater than or equal to zero, we're just checking that we are not equal to zero. And in this case, once again, in the case where we fail our predicate, we're just returning std uh, colon colon null op to signify that we are not able to compute a value. And last but not least, moving on to question three, there are two different solutions for this, one using the compose from question one and another one just sort of hard coding it. Our first one is the one that hard codes it. Looks very similar to what we saw in, um, in our first question where we were defining compose, where we calculate R, which is gonna be the reciprocal. If we get an actual reciprocal here, then we're gonna pass that value with the value method to safe root, otherwise return std null opt. Or because we don't wanna repeat this pattern everywhere, we can use the uh, Cleisley category for partial functions uh, compose function to basically just pass it the two functions that we wanna to compose together. And then compose will take care of this, like checking that at each stage we have an optional. And uh, because we don't have first class functions in C++, um, we need to find a way to pass these to our compose function. And the easiest way to do this, in my opinion, is just to sort of wrap these in Lambda uh, expressions, and then you can compose them together. So this is uh, super nice, in my opinion. And yeah, I think this, this chapter is extremely uh, useful in terms of starting to understand what we're going to see uh, when we get to monads. So that is the C++ solution. Let's take a look at the very interesting, in my opinion, APL solution. So we do not have some types or optional types in uh, APL. So we have to define our own. And I'm not a type design expert in APL, but everything is an array in APL. So in my opinion, the easiest way to do this is just to define your optional to be a two element array, where the first element in your array represents the is valid. So if it's zero, that means it's not valid. And if it's one, it is valid. And the second element represents your value. So when it's not valid, we just give it this uh, zilda, 
which stands for an empty array. So it's basically a null value. And then uh, when we do have a valid value, we're basically just going to represent whatever value that is. So and so once we have null opt and make optional setup, we basically just need to define has value and value. So has value just is going to return you the first element of our two element array. And we can do that using a symbol called first. Um, and value, we want the second element. So there's a couple different ways we can do this. We could do one drop. We could do a negative one take, which is going to grab the last one. But my favorite way to do this, and I think it's the idiomatic way to do it, but I'm not an APL expert, is to reverse to reverse uh, your uh, two element array and then take the first. So um, you might think that this is less efficient, but I'm pretty sure that there is uh, an idiom recognition optimization for these this two uh, symbol two symbols juxtaposed next to each other so that they know that this is just taking the last element of your array. And so once we have all this, then we can go on to define safe root, safe reciprocal, and the composition of the two. So safe root is um, defined by the following, very similar actually to the C++ solution. So we're checking if our argument is greater than or equal to zero. And if it is, then we're just going to call make optional and pass it the value of our argument omega to the power of 0 0.5, which is just square root. We don't have a square root function in dialog APL. I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong about that. And then safe reciprocal is the exact same format, except we're checking is our argument omega uh, not equal to zero. If that's the case, we take the reciprocal. So in APL, reciprocal is just monadic division. So this is the division symbol. And in the dyadic case, it's just you know left argument divided by right argument. But when you omit the left argument, it acts as one divided by or taking the inverse or the reciprocal of a number. So I think this is a really, really beautiful. And a great choice by uh, Ken Iverson. And in both of these cases, if we fail our predicate, we just return null opt. And once we have these two, we can define safe root reciprocal, which is doing what we did um, before in the C++ solution. So first, uh, taking the safe reciprocal of our argument omega, storing that in R, then checking does R have value? Uh, if so, then we can call safe root and uh, performing that on the value that is stored in R. So that's sort of the unwrapping of our optional and then otherwise returning null opt. Note that there is no alternative compose solution because as I've mentioned in a previous video, you cannot return a function from a, a defund from a defund or a function from a function in APL. Technically there is a way, but it's really messy and it's not sort of built in. And so I just choose not to do it. But working through this in APL, I thought was really awesome. I wasn't sure it was gonna be possible, but the resulting code I think is actually super clean and um, is a great exercise uh, for someone that is interested in learning APL. That is all I have to say about the exercises and the uh, textbook chapter. I would highly recommend, as I mentioned earlier in the video, check out Category Theory Lecture 3.2, where Bartage covers Kleisley categories. Like I said, it is a just more in-depth version of what I've covered here, and it also stays uh, completely true to what is covered in Chapter 4 of the textbook. That's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. Have a great day, and we'll see you in the next one.